The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. All right. Ready to go to the next presentation of ACI 376. Uh, this will be done by Mike S. Brannon, uh, talking about foundation requirements. And remember, we talked about our code is, a, is quite different from most codes that you find in ACI. And that we cover design and construction and the foundation. And you were looking at the total package from the ground up through the uh, roof of the tank. And Mike is a Retired, that's a nice term. I wish I could someday look forward to that. I don't know if I'll ever afford it. But, uh, retired civil geotechnical engineer who's worldwide foundation experience in many different projects, including refrigerated liquid gas storage, provided the committee with a broad perspective on what is necessary and achievable within the code. Mike has provided geotechnical engineering expertise on onshore and offshore projects. He was staff upstream civil geotechnical engineer, chief geotechnical engineer for Phillips Petroleum, civil engineer for Van Gundy and Associates, and captain in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at Fort Leonard Wood and the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. He grew up operating heavy construction and farm equipment and obtained Eagle Scout rank in western Kansas. His degrees in civil engineering and geology from Kansas State University and a master's in civil slash environmental engineering from the University of Oklahoma. He has attended a host of seminars and short courses as well as presenting seminars and portions of courses on several topics. Please welcome Mike Brannon. Well, the critical part of about any tank or structure for that matter is the form of concrete structure that contains the regulated level did not include any post holes for my father to put in a pants all over the place. But I had all contact with soils and machines. There are basically really only two types of foundations, shallow foundations, which come to grow up and down in our case, the annular rings and mass. These are very large annular rings and mass. And they just bear on the soil as the air volume from improve so well that you have at the at site in order to support this structure. And the sheet foundations, which again can be broken into two different types, driven piles or real pile meters. And essentially they are individual members that you know, haven't had any of that to support the structure. And you just drop the carrier the load carrying capacity through you know, the soils and dignity that does not have you know, the capacity to put on a deeper shallow foundation. Deep foundations are always more expensive than the shallow ones. And what are the performance issues you run into? Are you having to support the live and dead load out there on the wrong structure? So you have a lot of you know, issues and determining what those loads are, and then will the soils be taken to the decay of actually support those loads. And then there's controlling the settlement. And settlement very often controls the actual bearing pressure or the pile loading that you use. You have an in initial settlement during the construction of the first load, a long-term settlement that occurs over the life of the tank or through some period of the tank until it's reached an essential equilibrium. And another issue that we often don't like to address is that you can have 
differential settlement, and that means that the bank settles differentially. Now, the same applying to other three locations is this problem. And then the foundation must provide extreme payment, such as plus storms, earthquakes, and fire. Now, in the blood, LG and or any refrigerated electric gas tends to be rather light, and you can get a tremendous uplift for it as the tank attempts to flow. If you look at the tank, put a lot of stress on the foundation, files, or you, know, you can have a weight there to keep it one plus. Storms, again, you have storm surface conditions, but most of the tanks in the city are going to be near coastal areas. Earthquakes, potential for liquefaction, movements uh, of the structure and the sloshing, all that has to be absorbed by the foundation and resisted by the foundation. And fire, if there could be a fire in every tank, it's going to be exposed to fire and it can be to that foundation help and sustain the tank and then load that it may experience with the fire and life of the adjacent tanks. Now, this has always been a problem because owners and a lot of project engineers and contractors don't like to spend the money on a geotechnical investigation. This goes back a long time. This line comes from Ivan Balzer, who was Phelps Chief Geotechnical Engineer for many years, and he put this up that we can save 100, 700 lira by my belief that you get that from that day, and then we know how that all turned out. Or we're still working on how that's going to turn out. Now, the geotechnical engineer is very important to this, to this you know, project, or any project, and to do a comprehensive investigation at the a minimum cost, or at least a reasonable cost. I'll start with you know, the regional information and published work that's in the area and do a good net cost study, if you will. Of course, it's out there what you can expect. And then the most sensitive problem, either aerial photos, photography, or just what's, see what's out there now, the photography, and the geomorphology look like, and satellite photos, and there's satellite energy that you can look at a lot of different factors uh, with the uh, landscape, there's seven different thermal images. And you can try to drop down to geodesics, okay? And this would be actually on site, or even in some cases, you know, aerial from a helicopter or an aircraft, and you can get seismic and now, electromagnetic, it went electromagnetic to be the aerial fire, so I think it will have to be faster than that. Then you get good general information about the real distribution of differences in the formations of this particularly. Find things like caves, uh, channels, open area channels that don't appear. The easy mind be like, where should I go run my uh, investigation and what should I have the most uh, various. Then we get to the actual field test. This is where you're going to spend a lot of money up front and using cone tenometers or drill equipment to actually test the soils in place and obtain sample. Uh, the two different pieces of equipment make the difference. This is common. Uh, we'll get you a continuous a readout of soft soil of the differences in stratagery that won't be a significant bad. And it gives you to get the uh, bearing pressure, the slot the friction pressure, the easy metric uh, you can get what the fall pressure is. You can be the size elements, you can get the sizing uh, transmission characteristics of the soil. Literally on an inch by inch basis, or 25 millimeters by 25 millimeters. If you want to look at a picture of a cone and see what it looks like, Food Grove has a food down there, and they have a picture of a 25 ton cone that you 
all of those that that's going to occur somewhere with a at center roughly one and a half times the diameter. And at parameters to about 85% of the diameter. Give you an idea of where you're at. Maybe you can go and let more you know. And then for earthquake geotechnics, for provision earlier in this talk, very important, and it's a good idea to always do a site-specific seismic hazard set because the G-SHAP or USGS maps, and they tend to be kind of general for a particular and they also tend to be conservative. By doing a specific one, you may be able to typically will be able to select ground accelerations and gain velocities and displacements that are less than shown on a G-SHAP map or a USGS map. That is, what the converse curve, that's a good thing too. <laughs> and those are used to calculate the seismic response and structure. For me, we went through that. We talked a little bit about the soil structure and interaction. Okay. It's not as important on the site class as A and B, but with the uh, uh, ASC and 7. But on the lower glass soil, we may be kind of slight, quite important. <laughs> You're going to be looking at soil liquefaction and spreading. Talk about that for both the shape shut down earthquake and the operation basis earthquake. And then you can begin to consider what mitigation methods will work, you know, and what's the potential for damage, what's the potential to mitigate the uh, issues that you found to be preserve the life and structure on the SSE and ODE. Okay, for shallow foundation design, if that we really begin to do a design, okay. we just in the code, okay, uh, chapter 10, talk about the allowable bearing pressure being the lesser of the permissible total and differential total. That's really the biggest control. And then you've got the ultimate bearing capacity in the soils that run to be and divided by the minimum factor safety. And in table 10.1, we define what the minimum factor safety you should use for the shallow foundation. And then we also require that one checks for edge shear or base shear. Edge shear is the proportion of the soil to the shear away under the part of the tank. Base shear is where the whole tank can shear away and rotate. Then we discussed some limits on overturning the anchors and how to do that. Uh, we have the uh, sliding resistance for minimum factors of safety. And we recommend for wind and operating basis earthquake that that be at least one and a half. And for the SFC, 1.2. So, uniform, be uniform, you know, and that's permitted if the structure accommodates. You can sign a structure that can settle three feet, and it will do that, the entire feet, it's a good life. But you can do it. Differential or uniform, the planner type building, you, that building is limited to one over five hundred. You got a 500 foot diameter tank in one foot. Dishing along regular line, this is the dishing in the back. We have a max of three eighths of an inch or uh, one in 300. Uh, the footing around the perimeter, the lesser of one over 500 from the maximum calculated for the unit form filter. And one needs to consider days and times and soil thickness for the overlapping of other loads that may be you know, placed on the soils around you because the soils, the loads are being distributed to be roughly say 45 degrees. That's maybe a little too much, but there is a, a distribution of loads that go back. Big foundation. 
Again, you've got numerous components, files, and they're added to make them on directly there. The three file packs, and that occurs both in driven and passing place files, and you have to make a selection of which files to do at that site. You're in a file selection study, what you've got available and the cost and how soon that you get there. It's always a good idea. Because on one site, if you didn't follow that, it would save over $30 million on the files that they can solve. They have done a site selection study and come up with a lot of different One site we did that on, we saved $12 million. It's not an incident. And then the high testing program. The earlier you can do it, you've been in the public use action, you turn the soil, the earlier you can do it, the better. And then don't let someone tell you that you can well with high, the high testing is the start of construction. And you can avoid that for legal reasons. It's a, it's a real mess. But the sooner you can do that, and one plan on your case, they went from their standard 80 foot pile that could bear 30 tons to 120 foot pile that could bear 120 tons. And now that's what they're doing. They did a little better pile selection study. They did a little bigger out what they need to think. You have to consider the pile drive effect. What's the effect of the pile on each other as you drive? Where might the net, where might the file be, where might be the effect on everything, fish, animals, humans here in Colorado. And settlement down right. This is where you have a softer element in the intersection. And the file not only will the have Capacity due to the soils, you know, bearing bearing against to the the files and the friction past the files, they will also carry a load. So if you have a section above a large section of soil above the softer zone, and the pile has to carry that softer zone too at the rate that the pile has friction. So that makes the pile, pile much longer. And it can really make a big difference. And that's the negative skin pressure factor. And the downgrade of the curve. Collateral power capacity needs foundation as long as time. And the code, we talked about that being the lesser of it. But the inverse that will be permissible and total differential settlement. Again, you get by the power depth. And the ultimate power capacity divided by the minimum factor of safety. And we define that as table 10.2. Table 10.2 allows you, based on the inspection that you do the file and the verification that you do the file as important, to reduce that minimum factor of safety a great deal. Table 10.2 is a very interesting little table. The, uh, and then the structural training costs. The pot will only bear so much, and yeah, that's to be end up being collected your memory. We're not into that. We have over-returning in the upper, as you did in the other, for the shallow foundation. And lateral load resistance. What's lateral load? This will be particularly on the first way. Could be in the storms and the storm surge coming in. Ground and root. Well, the size of our soils maybe are too expensive to do or too tough to do a deep foundation. What can we do? Well, there are a variety of things that you can do. And the commentary of the code discusses this a little bit. You can remove and replace with better material. That's hard to do and expensive. Also, one minute particular package with soil density improvement and a variety of ways of doing that, including the vibrating pile driver cut, which is known as fiber open packing. Dynamic compaction, which is a very large weight, it's dropped over and over and over on the soil. And 
you the way to bring some handset settlement. Oftentimes you'll do that with a dynamic compaction. And then in preload, we have branch for handset for quick branch. To uh, preload with excess overburden, you have one facility that's been set in there with more than 20 plus meters of soil for a couple of years now. Originally, they didn't want to be preloaded because, oh, it's going to take too long, you know, more than nine months. And then they found that it's going to take about ten months just to get plowed. So they thought you were going to get to do it. And have they gone to plow, they still wouldn't have made the uh, decision for about ten five years now. It's back down the back and just ready to go. Uh, each soil makes some of cement. Okay, a lot of materials to stabilize the soil. That's what we're looking at. I'll be pretty interested in the pretty good soil. Oh, my law convention does to be on red grains. Red grains are a method of improving resistance to soil, like a passion during the earthquake, because it allows the water to drain out quickly when it's shaken by the earthquake, and then soils, the force of the water in the soils, give them a quick path to drag it out of the soil. Foundation details, we discussed those a little bit on the code, but uh, we always want the groundwater to be above the bottom of the tank. So the bottom of the tank is going to probably be cold sometimes. And you don't want to be forming an iceberg underneath the tank or an ice bowl. So you want to have the groundwater put away from there. Even getting it under the severe floods uh, and all that is not a good idea. So you want to have that drainage away from the tank to the sun to be able to pump off the water. Uh, that can be, you can use foundation feeding to control the cross heating, you use heating cables, ventilated here to have foundation, a well-drained uh, granular soil with a deep water table to be insulated from all the time. You can use sediment mountain monitoring to establish in the code. We we'll require an inundate permanent survey points you know, this is visible by four of the events you can plot. And it's based on more than 30 feet, 3 feet, or 10 meters around the perimeter. And phenomena are used to uh, make an addition in the, in the area and then under the tank. You have a thermal system to monitor the bottom area. You have seismic uh, accelerometers is a new requirement. But they're wanting you to put one on the foundation, one on the roof, and one on the free field away from the uh, tank for reference point. There's the settlements made during construction, hydro testing, commissioning manually, then phenometers within the lead settlement, so the, the levels within the tank are uh, roughly the same. Thermal cool down, we're going to do that. There's the cool down for the end service dimensioning and these three people. And a lot of people put in continuous thermal on. Sizing is what you can do to the accelerometers, which is continuous and got to be regular maintenance. Corrosion and monitoring with your body protection done twice a year. Uh, the code provides some things for inspection and testing. Or minimum requirements of testing materials and installation. installation. It also provides minimum qualifications of welders, respective technicians, and for minimum documentation to be obtained and furnished to the owner. And remember, I talked about the okay, It's another ball to fly. But people going, you know, the yields are going different directions in their own way. Finally, make a minimum mind, both of them get it that great. Right. And then questions of these. Any questions for Mike? Well, the final thoughts are, remember, birth is a thing Mother Earth is very tricky. Like surgeons, she takes care of the states and it's a little bit. Use the mic, please. We thought we talked about foundation being shown. I'm not sure how deep these guys usually are, but how about 
total sum of the replacement of the pure excavated uh, material, uh, and you're close to good material. Is over excavation uh, something that uh, is considered? Or, or, or? Yeah, you might well over. Well, how deep would you over excavate? Except not in One thing to remember, these are very large structures over a large diameter. So when you think of the soil mass that's really influenced by these high lows, and we're talking you know, approaching, what, 80, 100 feet in terms of depth of the liquid. Even though LNG is lighter, it's still got a significant amount of weight. It influences a very deep mass of soil underneath the foundation. I know in water and wastewater, we look at, you're influencing at least the diameter of the tank uh, with significant soil pressure. So 150 foot diameter, you're going 150 foot down into the soil. So taking out and replacing may not be very economical to go to that kind of depth. 